Hi, my name is Brittany Stewart, and in this video of Don't Get Stumped, we're going to talk about atropine response test. So this is a wonderful diagnostic that can be extremely helpful to us on the clinic floor. And so we're going to walk through when you do it, how you do it, and how you interpret it. So step one, when do you need to do it? So these are for patients with some type of bradycardia or bradyarrhythmia in which they're either having prominent pauses, sinus arrest, or just an overall low heart rate that we want to further explore. AV block is something also that'll be indicated for an atropine response test. The exceptions are if it's a third degree AV block, they're unlikely to respond to atropine. It often won't hurt them to try, but for those patients, especially if they're clinical, you may go straight to placing a pacemaker opposed to doing further diagnostics such as an atropine response test. Another thing is a lot of cases of say first degree AV block or very clear Mobitz type 1 AV block, they may have enough characteristics that you're confident that it's vaguely mediated without need to do a expensive diagnostic or administer a drug you may not actually need. What an atropine response test is going to tell you is if the bradycardia is being vaguely mediated. So how much is the autonomic nervous system contributing to the bradycardia? So there's many different ways to define atropine, but the short and sweet is that it's going to block or decrease parasympathetic tone of the autonomic nervous system. And it's going to do this most specifically at the level of the SA node and the AV node. Now this is very important. So what atropine is going to do is it's going to increase the firing of the SA node of the pacemaker cells, and it's going to increase the conduction of electrical current or electrical flow through the AV node. There is a lot less uh, parasympathetic nervous tone or innervation at the level of the ventricles. And this is a really good thing because if there were more tone, then this would be a very dangerous drug to give. So essentially, when you give atropine, you're messing with everything that's supraventricle. You're not doing much on the ventricle level. And so because of that, that's why ventricular tachycardia would be an extremely rare side effect of atropine. Next, if it is actually a safe diagnostic to perform. So if you have something like negative P waves on your baseline ECG, ideally, if possible, just boot that to the cardiologist. The idea behind not giving a patient like this atropine is that those negative P waves are likely signifying that they're coming from a place within the atrial myocardium and not the SA node itself. So if you gave that patient atropine, you may induce an atrial tachycardia. The other thing is that if you have significant underlying heart disease, ideally you wouldn't perform an atropine response test because that drug is going to ultimately increase the myocardial oxygen consumption and potentially promote development of a supraventricular tachycardia or VTAC. With that said, we sometimes have to do that. We have to give it to a patient with underlying heart disease. One example is that bradycardia itself can induce dilation of the heart. And so if we're working up a bradycardic patient, they may simply have that as part of the disease spectrum. And then the other thing is that, um, kind of the second example, is that a lot of our dogs with bradyarrhythmias are going to be our Westies and our Schnauzers that are at a higher risk of degenerative valve disease as well. And so you often will have concurrent disease or induced disease um, of, the, of the heart when you have a bradycardic patient and you just kind of have to give them atropine anyway. The other thing is that if you have a patient with, say, a narrow angle glaucoma, ileus, urinary blockage, just think of anything that could have a negative response to an anticholinergic agent, don't give it atropine. Next is going to be to provide the atropine at a dose of 0.04 mg per kick. I strongly recommend to do it IV. That is the most predictable, reliable route and will provide you the fastest results in about 15 minutes. Ideally, the patient would be connected to telemetry during this process, but if you don't have enough people to monitor the patient the entire time, you could step away after administration. Just don't step away too long because A, you don't want to miss the response, and B, if this is the odd patient that does have side effects from atropine, you want to be on top of it. And so make sure your paper speed is 50 millimeters per second. That's going to be the slower paper speed option for the common ones we use and will allow you to see the most detail in, in the ECG. Next, you need to mentally prepare yourself for the high likelihood of a transient AV block forming. The AV blocks are non-conductive P waves 
usually occurs about maybe five minutes or so before the actual response happens. And what it reflects is that the atropine will start working on the SA node before it takes full effect on the AV node. And so the SA node is firing faster, but the AV node for a transient period of time is not conducting it as fast. And so some of those P waves are being blocked, and that's what we'll see on the surface ECG. It is almost always a transient, quick process that is harmless to the patient from a hemodynamic standpoint and almost expect it to some degree. So that doesn't represent that there is or is not pathology. That is just a normal physiologic response to the drug itself. Next, when you are at about the 15 minute mark and you hopefully start seeing that increase in the heart rate, you're gonna record for two minutes. Ideally, you'd print that out, label start time and everything so that you can look back on this later. And then finally, you're going to ask yourself, did I achieve a full response or a partial response? A full or positive response is going to be greater than 140 beats per minute, sinus tachycardia in a dog. A partial, and this is why it's nice to print out those ECGs to look at later when you're not actively in the moment, is because a partial can be more subtle and a guy's a, need a little bit closer of looking. And so a partial means that the heart rate went up, it just didn't go up above 140 beats per minute. And then of course a negative atropine response test is that it said mm -mm, and didn't change at all. So what do these results mean? If you have a positive atropine response test, so your heart rate went above 140 beats per minute, that means that vagal tone was playing a large part in that bradycardia. Now this may be a normal variant of the patient where they just have a high vagal tone. It could reflect brachycephalic syndrome where these animals are in a hypoxic state, they have a higher vagal tone and a lower heart rate because of that or you could have a pathologic cause for elevated vagal tone um, in the form of say GI respiratory ocular disease. And so if you have a positive response, your mind is gonna go to either normal variants or pathologic causes for elevated vagal tone. If you instead have a partial or a negative response, then you're gonna shift more towards that there's actually something intrinsically wrong with the SA or AV nodes in which they're unable to do their job. And so that could be that you accidentally administered the dose wrong. Maybe it accidentally went sub-Q when you tried to give it IV and the response just hasn't happened yet. It's gonna happen in 15 minutes. So make sure there's no errors from that aspect. Another thing is make sure there's not a metabolic disturbance leading to electrolyte derangement because that can definitely affect how atropine works. And I should say how the SA and AV node work. Um, is that dog on any drugs that may mess with the AV or SA node? Um, and then once you've ruled out kind of more of those exogenous causes for a partial or negative response, then you're left with, do I have true acenodal dysfunction or sick sinus syndrome that we see in Westies and Schnauzers mostly. Do I have AV nodal fibrosis, which is an idiopathic process? Um, do I have something infiltrative or neoplastic that is at the level of the SA or AV node that's present, preventing proper functioning? Or do I have something like a myopathy of the atrial wall that's leading to more of a standstill process? And so depending on what your results are, you can kind of hone in on what the underlying disease state may be. And so another thing that the atropine response test can shed light on is the potential chances of success with medical management. And so a lot of people think, or that I've heard as feedback, is they say, oh, the atropine response test was positive, don't have to worry about it, which is true a lot of the times. But keep in mind, you can have such high vagal tone that it acts in a pathologic way that the patient has syncope from it or other clinical manifestations. And so just because you have a positive atropine response test doesn't mean that that patient has a completely benign process that does not warrant medical intervention. So the other step that you can take with the results of the atropine response test is giving insight into how successful medical management may be. And so for the patients that had a positive or a partial response, they are technically more likely to respond to a positive coronotropic drug, such as theophylline, as an example. Negative atropine responses, are, or cases, I should say, are less likely to respond to medical management and more fitting for a transvenous pacemaker intervention, but that's not always the case. And so another thing that's really important um, to mention is that there are many cases that are atropine negative, 
uh, atropine response negative that go on to respond well to medical intervention in which we can extend their quality and quantity of life. So especially in cases where transvenous pacemaker is not possible, whether it's simply not available in the area or if it is too costly or so forth, um, and those patients don't give up, still definitely try medical management with them um, because even with a negative response, they still may respond to medical intervention. And then final note is with horses. Horses very often have first degree AV block or Mobitz type one second degree AV block. It is more likely to be vaguely mediated because they're very high parasympathetic tone animals and much less likely to be pathologic. And so from an indication standpoint, we have a much lower indication to ever do an atropine response test on them. And then even more importantly, because atropine is an anticholinergic agent, you may induce colic in a horse, which is going to be a whole lot more concerning <laughs> than the first degree AV block was. So just don't, very rare to do it in horses. And if we do need to do it, have the cardiologist do it. So if something goes wrong, you can just fully blame it on us. <laughs> So that concludes this quick lecture on atropine response test. I hope this is helpful. So next time that you have a bradyarrhythmia that you can confidently know if an atropine response test is needed, how to do it and how to interpret it. <laughs>